let, let me say first that there's too much hype. In other words, uh, I, I feel that what I am is a working mathematician. I, I gave a talk in the Yershoff Symposium yesterday with the same title. Uh, it's, uh, the, the content of this talk is not entirely disjoint from it, but uh, that talk uh, was really about the fact that I was surrounded as a student and with no uh, real advisor by several people interested in going on in logic. And the only part of yesterday's lecture that I want to refer to is that back in the early 1950s, which is a long time ago, uh, my fellow students, uh, and there were no logicians on the faculty of the University of Chicago, the uh, math department, that my fellow students were Ray Smullyan, Stanley Tenenbaum, Bill Howard, Michael Morley, Paul Cohen, and Edward J. Nelson. And uh, in addition, uh, uh, we all were friends with another student, uh, which is Eric Bishop. And if you look at that list, it lists as a, a list of people, all of whom made substantial contributions to logic uh, because of a common interest, even though there was no one on the faculty at the University of Chicago who was a professional logician uh, in, in, in mathematics. So that's, that's the leftover from my, the uh, lecture I gave, uh, the Yerf Yershoff lecture. Uh, the, uh, the lecture today, I'd like to start with uh, 1957. In 1957, there was a five week uh, conference uh, here at, at Cornell. Uh, the sponsors were uh, Alfred Tarski and J. Barclay Rosser, Tarski of uh, Berkeley and J. Barclay Rosser of Cornell. Uh, I got here as a, uh, someone who just got their PhD in the following way, that I was uh, walking down the hall uh, in, at the University of Chicago. That was a, a, in, a work, work, a, in a temporary position uh, uh, doing military research. And Paul Halmas stopped me in the hall and said, you know, there's going to be a conference at uh, uh, Cornell uh, uh, the, the next summer. You ought to go. Uh, so uh, I did. But the background of the conference was the following. Uh, this was, I, as far as I'm concerned, the, great, the most important conference in the history of modern logic. Uh, the background was the following. Uh, Alfred Tarski uh, uh, got the suggestion from Halmus that there should be such a conference because there'd been no unified uh, logic conference at all. And uh, Tarski at that time had been at uh, 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 Berkeley for a number of years, but had no national connections at all. And at that time, Rosser was the big wheel. In other words, he had served in World War II running uh, the Bureau of Standards, which was responsible for a great number of military things. And he knew everybody. The uh, National Science Foundation uh, hadn't even formed a uh, uh, program in uh, logic at all. This is 1957. Uh, there's no, uh, the only people who had any grants connected with logic were uh, at uh, Berkeley and uh, I've forgotten where else, but, that's probably there, but only, there were only a couple of them. And, and the, the funder of mathematical logic had actually been the, the Office of Naval Research uh, due to uh, Mina Reese, who uh, no, no, name is known here because she ra ran the um, math part of the Office of Naval Research and uh, suggested uh, the National Science Foundation uh, programs which support research. And that was a very important figure before she went later to CUNY, uh, to the uh, institution of which our team off is. But then in any case, what happened was that Rosser as a big wheel managed to get NSF to, to support this conference with a really quite large grant for the time. And uh, sort of, and everybody in the world uh, came to the conference who was prominent, with the exception of Gödel, who sent uh, Kreisel as his representative uh, to uh, present a couple of uh, things there. So suddenly, this isolated uh, non-community of logicians who'd never seen each other at all uh, were no longer isolated. Uh, they all were in the same room at the same time, and I was fortunate to go to that meeting. I regarded this seminal and the the. Uh, development not only of American logic, but of worldwide logic because uh, they, they got, the grant covered the foreigners. And this is a period when there was no National Science Foundation program in logic. That was not done until 1961. 
and that I and uh, Simon Cochin moved off the Office of Naval Research to the first National Science Foundation grants in logic. And I kept those grants going for 60 years, which is uh, may have been a record, may not. Uh, but uh, I, I, uh, I'm still taking on students, but uh, I, taking grants uh, when the uh, uh, needs of the graduate uh, students and postdocs are so great seemed to be very inappropriate at that, that, that very advanced age. So I finally quit after 60 years, but that's a long time. But in any case, I, I was basically in on the beginning of that. So at this 57 conference, I met for the first time uh, a great number of people, uh, the, all the Berkeley people, of uh, uh, Henkin and uh, Tarski and so on, and Vaught and so on, and the Princeton people, the uh, various graduates of Princeton, and uh, 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 for example, uh, Steve Claney and the uh, roster himself and so on, and also Europeans such as uh, 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 Beth uh, from Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, somehow uh, the world community in logic was formed at that point, uh, but still quite unfunded. Uh, so uh, I regard that as, as the as seminal meeting in, this, in five weeks long in uh, the formation of the, the modern mathematical logic as a unified discipline. Previous to that, the Tarski group did what it did, which was to follow up Tarski's work. Uh, the uh, uh, Princeton had uh, Church and, and uh, Gödel at, uh, at the Institute. And uh, of course, Church's students like uh, Claney and Rosser themselves, or for that matter, Turing, they were uh, very good, but they, and so on. But the, there was no unity between these subjects. It only came out of that uh, 1957 conference. So uh, that, that got the, the logic going. Then in about, 19, as I've just said before, in about 1961, uh, the, uh, the powers that be, which is mostly Rosser actually, got the uh, National Science Foundation to start a logic program. And I had one of the, uh, I and Cy Cochin had were uh, on this first uh, uh, logic grant. And of course, the, the, uh, uh, in, in those years, uh, the program director was a man named Ralph Krauss, who's long since retired, but <clears throat> he was an algebraist from uh, Harvard. And he uh, superintended the program for many, many, many years. So that, that, that was sort of the uh, uh, beginning. Now, now let me go back and, and uh, uh, to uh, the years that immediately followed. So I, I got to uh, uh, Cornell in 59. Uh, the, uh, one of my uh, fellow students and a good friend, uh, Paul Cohen, got his degree in analysis a year or two later and went to Rochester for a year and uh, within a year had won a national prize, one of the AMS prizes in analysis. And uh, the background for his going into logic was that he was one of our uh, undergrad, uh, graduate friends in this group of, lo of logic students without advisors at the University of Chicago back in the 19, early 1950s. And he had picked up logic by absorption uh, with the group but mostly from Stanley Tenenbaum. And uh, that was his informal background in logic. Now, the thing about Paul was that he uh, really wanted to be a great man. So what Paul did was to go to uh, leaders or students, or professors, whoever was at Chicago during that period when he was a student and say, what is the principal unsolved problem in your subject? I might want to work on it. Well, he, he worked on the Riemann hypothesis and he worked on things in algebraic geometry and so on. But uh, uh, those uh, uh, attempts to do problems in those fields, he didn't have a, a new idea. Uh, what he said to me uh, was that uh, uh, he looked at logic and he thought that he was uh, smarter than anybody else in the subject. Uh, in other words, what Michael Morley often said was that he had a contempt for the rest of the people on the subject. But he did see that the whole mathematical community would be interested in uh, the independence of choice and the continuum hypothesis. So he got a hold of the small book that uh, in the Prince, in a, a small orange book in the, the Princeton series, with, uh, which is uh, attributed to Gödel. In other words, it's 
uh, the, the consistency proofs for the choice and the continuum hypothesis are in that little book. And he read them, but he read them differently from everybody else. But I would like to give the background, which a lot of people don't know for that book. Uh, if you look at it, uh, and uh, you haven't had the modern background in logic, but you look at it from the point of view of somebody at that period, uh, it uh, looks very mysterious because of the uh, sort of abstract philosophical uh, uh, language used to describe the notions. Uh, but aside from that, what happened was that uh, both uh, uh, Claney and Rosser, as students, uh, pestered Gurnall uh, to give a series of lectures on, the, uh, on his uh, paper, which had appeared in the National Academy uh, years earlier. And uh, at their urging, uh, he actually did uh, prepare very, very detailed lectures. When he gave the lectures, uh, uh, a man named Brown, who disappeared into industry, took notes as fast as he could. Uh, Girdle wrote on the board very rapidly. And all the side comments made by Girdle uh, were unrecorded by anybody. And so Rosser and Claney and uh, Arlen Brown were in the audience. And Brown took it down, but he couldn't get any of the motiv motivating results down, the mo motivating uh, the motivations that, 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 that Girdle used down. So the thing that came out published almost against uh, Girdle's uh, will was the, uh, that, that little book. And it became a kind of a mystery because of the fact that all the explanations were missing. There were a few footnotes that were added in by Girdle before publication, but the explanations had all been elided from the, from, from the book. I think that was the reason that uh, when Girdle had done the work back in 1933 or four, uh, it uh, had no effect uh, on the general uh, logic or mathematics community as far as research goes until uh, uh, Paul's uh, work. And one of the things that I wanted to record was the circumstances uh, of the uh, discovery. This is also recorded elsewhere, but part of it is not. Uh, the, according to what, what uh, Paul told me was that he had been uh, on a uh, road trip for light gambling between uh, Las Vegas and Stanford and thinking about uh, the uh, uh, definition of uh, uh, what, what we now think of as the definition of forcing. And uh, suddenly he realized that if you, uh, he, they were, he put down necessary conditions. And suddenly he realized if, that if you use the necessary conditions as sufficient conditions, that you could actually get an inductive definition of, uh, of uh, forcing. And uh, that, that was his uh, key. Uh, but I, I want to go back just a bit, which is that uh, remember that, uh, that Paul really did express to those of us who knew him well that his uh, uh, feeling that he could solve one of the great problems. He read the, uh, the uh, book, and uh, he, the very, very first thing he got out of the book was a paper which is now, to a large extent, forgotten, but uh, it was his first publication in, in logic which is the minimal model. Uh, now, he was not a syntacticalist. And there was no point at which he actually verified syntactically that his uh, proof worked. He, he, his, his mental set was semantic. And uh, those of you uh, uh, who've done set theory understand what I mean. That's why in his uh, initial paper, uh, he has an axiom, uh, uh, the axiom that there are inaccessibles. Uh, because it, it, when you have inaccessibles, then you actually have uh, uh, sort of set switcher models, and uh, you can uh, apply uh, uh, looking for a minimal submodel with, uh, in, with with semantical reasoning. What, and so, uh, in any case, uh, the first paper he published was on the minimal model for set theory, and then having done that in a sort of a semantic way. Uh, he realized that this um, accountable minimal model could be extended by uh, adding on sets and that all you had to do was, uh, to, for example, for constructability was to be uh, add on a set that was sufficiently indefinable. And what he said was that uh, what he wanted to do was to trace back every property of infinite sets to properties of finite sets so that when he extended it, he uh, gave it uh, a, a, a he was able to introduce a constructible set, which is highly indefinable. 
with that, and I'm, I'm almost quoting him at the time. I mean, it's very close to what, what he said. And uh, as I say, going back and forth to uh, Las Vegas, he managed to uh, see that the, the necessary conditions for extending the minimal model uh, could be taken as sufficient ones. His first paper came out very semantically. In other words, he, he was not very confident with the uh, proofs uh, written formally uh, in, in logic by transfinite induction. Uh, in fact, quite uncomfortable with it. Uh, I told him that anybody who taught a, a uh, axiomatic set theory course would simply look at his things and say, oh yeah, I can write that out. He was very, very informal about it, very mathematical. So he went from the, now why would it, why, why would it be that he would uh, uh, have this uh, kind of an argument where uh, by finite extensions to put together the, uh, the, uh, the generic set that needed to do these uh, axiom of constructability. Uh, well, that he didn't say, but what I'm saying is that the University of Chicago education included the uh, uh, first category and second category sets as a method of construction. And we'd all taken the same course, which had in it uh, the, uh, the, the first and second category ideas and how you do the construction. And I feel it was probably kind of a leftover from that that uh, uh, led to the completion of this argument, but that's speculative, just purely speculative. So uh, I, I was now going to be a little bit historical, not, not wonderfully historical, but a little bit. Uh, I had uh, J. Barclay Rosser, when I got to Cornell, had assigned me his uh, uh, students because he was going down uh, to, I, I became the advisor of his uh, uh, incomplete PhD students. Uh, and, uh, but uh, except for one, which was Gerald Sachs. But in any case, I was, uh, uh, I basically replaced him at Cornell as he went to Princeton to run uh, uh, an activity that's connected with the National Security Agency, uh, the research activity. And uh, he was the director of it. Uh, uh, in 62, uh, uh, as, uh, as he returned to Cornell, he really, really, really wanted me to go down there for a, uh, and do some of their work. So I went down for, again, and uh, spart sponsored partially by the Institute and partially by that outfit. I spent that year uh, in Princeton. So, but one and, and half of it in uh, the the uh, the Institute for Advanced Study Housing Project. So one evening I got a call uh, from uh, Paul from California, whom I hadn't heard from for about two or three years, uh, at ordering me to uh, arrange a uh, talk for him because he'd done the uh, independence of the axiom of choice and the continuum hypothesis, and the only and he tried to get his proof checked by his colleagues at Stanford, he was uh, really not satisfied that they, they, that, uh, they checked it in a way which would be acceptable to the math community. And he was going to the source of all wisdom, which was Gödel, uh, to demand that he verify the thing for him and that I should arrange uh, the, uh, a talk for him at the Institute and also uh, 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 this visit to Gödel. And so, uh, we all, or he came to Princeton. The anecdote that's non-mathematical is that all the people who were from the University of Chicago in the 1950s, uh, who were at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, which is a lot because those, those were the, Chicago and Princeton were the leading departments at the time, uh, they got together for a party for Paul in the evening. And what was interesting about the party is that no one had a, positive uh, uh, feeling about being a graduate student. They had found uh, it, it being extremely taxing to be a graduate student at Chicago. Uh, just uh, when the discussion worked out, it was true of everybody. They, they, uh, Paul Cohn was only one of a bunch of luminaries. What it turned out was that they uh, had such a high opinion of the faculty, which was supposed to be the, at that moment, the best faculty in the world. I, actually, I think Moscow had a, as, as good or better a faculty, but nonetheless in the Western world, at that moment, uh, Chicago was at the top when, when we went in the fifties. 
uh, they felt so inferior to the senior professors at Chicago that it made them sort of miserable to walk in the building. I found that very interesting for people who were some of the biggest successes of the uh, uh, Chicago endeavor in the 1950s to set up a first class new department. But in any case, I had arranged a, uh, put up a I, I'd asked uh, another permanent member, uh, Dean Montgomery, to sponsor the talk. He didn't want to. He said, you sponsor it yourself. So I went and I put a little post on the Institute blackboard announcing that Paul was going to talk on the independence of choice in the continuum hypothesis. And then on the day of the meeting, you know, I discovered that the uh, auditorium there was locked and that nobody had a key. So the uh, decision was that it should, uh, the, the reason the auditorium was needed is that I expected 30 people in a uh, small uh, uh, lecture hall and 200 people showed up. So since the lecture hall was uh, completely locked up, uh, we used the tea room at the Institute and he uh, worked not off a blackboard, but off of uh, uh, sheets of the sheets on, a, uh, on one of these little stands. And so the, the uh, 200 people showed up. It was almost time for the talk. And then he got a call from a prominent logician. Well, actually the call was for me from a prominent logician uh, on the West Coast who said, you know, I don't think these are, are, are uh, real sets uh, that you've actually constructed. And at that point, Paul realized that the only person he thought had read his manuscript in detail and understood it hadn't. So he uh, got up and gave his talk before the, uh, this audience of 200 at the Institute, uh, giving a sort of quick outline of uh, his proofs of independence uh, with nobody having checked it. And he'd come to Princeton to have Girdle check it. Well, in the next week, Girdle did check it. And uh, at the end of the week, uh, okayed it. Uh, and uh, uh, basically Paul said that he had been very uncomfortable Paul said, said that he had told Gödel he'd been very uncomfortable about the whole thing. And of course, a, a response, which is a Kanamori's kind of, kind of summary of all of this, uh, was that, uh, uh, why do you say that? This is the most significant contribution to set theory since the formation of axiomatic set theory in the early 1920s. Uh, that was the, uh, the uh, uh, compliment that he got from uh, uh, Gödel. Now you can ask why it was that he felt so uncomfortable. I think at this late stage, after all these years, it was because he was not comfortable with formalization. He reasoned very semantically. That's why he had assumed in this paper, the uh, axiom of inaccessibles. It, you, you can then uh, have a model of set theory with, uh, which uh, you can think of as an ordinary everyday set from 1900. And as a result, you can go through uh, verifying things semantically. But the independence is a, is a syntactical thing. And he told me that he had, uh, in some sense, not written out uh, the uh, syntactical proofs. So it's just sheer mathematical power for him to have, have steamed through anyway. And I'm just telling you, he was. Uh, had a, he had a bad week while waiting for, uh, for a girdle. The first person that, uh, to uh, get a complete exposition from Paul Cohen of the solution then turned out to be G Gerald Sachs. Uh, Gerald was an assistant professor at Cornell. And I asked Paul, uh, no, I didn't, after discovering he was uncomfortable at the beginning of this week of waiting for verification, I asked uh, Paul whether he'd like to go up to Cornell. He'd been there before and uh, spend the weekend, uh, uh, which he did. And uh, he re exposited the whole thing in total detail to Gerald, who was a, in his own way a formalist. He always followed Pliny's notation in his papers. Uh, so he, he, he was, uh, he'd learned to, to do things formally at an early age. So he was probably the first one to actually go through uh, and uh, check the, uh, the details uh, formalistically. In any case, uh, uh, Paul returned and, and uh, uh, Gerdel located and he went back uh, quite happy to uh, California. And we, after that, uh, he, uh, 
did publish a paper uh, with a decision method for the piatic uh, field, uh, for first order theory of the piatic field. Uh, one wonders why he uh, took up that particular thing in which he'd had no interest previously and uh, no interest later. Uh, the, the answer is very funny. What had happened was that he uh, had not yet won the uh, 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 Fields Medal, but uh, my colleague, uh, uh, the Axon, my colleagues Axe and Cochin had won the uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the national, I guess, the Steel Prize in, in, in algebra, and uh, he felt a little bit of rivalry there, so he decided to take one of their main things, which was a decision method for periodic numbers, and show that it was actually uh, no, he actually really wanted to, to replace their entire apparatus by somewhat simpler apparatus. But what he succeeded in doing was getting another decision method for the piatic numbers, which he published in the New York Academy of Sciences. And then after that, I don't think we heard from him logically uh, because he turned his attention to the uh, uh, Riemann hypothesis and sort of never recovered from that. Uh, at a later point, he did say that he regretted not staying in logic a little longer. So, so but the next step, uh, which is a very interesting step, was that uh, immediately after his talk, uh, uh, there was a reception and a former undergraduate of mine, whom I sent to work with church, uh, was uh, there and said, I just completed my thesis uh, under church. You want to look at it? I looked at it and I said, you know, this is actually Pfefferman's thesis from five years ago. <laughs> And he said, well, what shall I do? And I said, well, jump on the bandwagon. In other words, uh, Paul has just done this. The first person to get into it uh, will certainly get something out of it. And that was East enforcing. Uh, the East in class forcing was a substitute thesis for a thesis. It was very good, but unfortunately had already been done. But the thesis advisor church was out of it. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't know anything about what was going on with Saul Pfefferman of the West Coast. So that was a, these are anecdotes from the distant past, but they do indicate how chancy things are. I gave a copy of the uh, 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 original Cohen paper to Stanley Tenenbaum. Uh, he and I had discussed years earlier the Suslin problem, and he worked on it, and he got it and, and, and uh, showed it to Gernel, who checked it for him. And uh, that, the, that, the, 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 that, and that's referred to by Kanemori as the first uh, piece of work in set theory that was not uh, a, a which, which was a consequence of Cohen, but uh, not directly in Cohen's direction. But I think I've explained why Bill Easton with Easton's class forcing was in a great hurry. It was spring and he had to get his degree. He, he, he founded the first applied logic corporation, but which actually failed but in any case, and he disappeared from my view. So I have not heard from him since. So the, the, now the other amusing thing is one of the people in this audience of 200 was uh, Bob, it was, was Salovey. And uh, Salovey was an algebraic topologist, another student uh, who got his PhD under Saunders McLean. And he was hanging around uh, the area. And as far as I can see, they, uh, he, he sort of reconstructed the detailed argument in a day or two after Cohen had uh, spoken. Because one week later, when I set up what was the first logic seminar devoted to Cohen's work, uh, at the, I set it up at the Institute, uh, uh, we started to sort of muddle through understanding Cohen's paper. And this, uh, at a certain point, this person at the back of the room popped up and said, well, in fact, you can do this uh, forcing for any partial ordering. So during the week, he had completely reconstructed uh, Cohen's work and uh, generalize it with uh, uh, partial orderings. Uh, I thought that was quite remarkable too. He, he walked right in and of course he was one of the, the big figures later. Uh, those were the uh, in absolutely initial days of this push in set theory. But what happened then was very interesting. As soon as this got out to the general mathematical community, which would I'd say about 1963-4, uh, 
logic became attractive rather than unattractive. And though the people in the traditional fields didn't pick up any of this, graduate students everywhere did. The result was that when I got back to Cornell, which is uh, only a few months after this discovery, uh, I discovered that uh, Sachs, who, who had been hired back as an assistant professor, had suddenly acquired in the new batch of students, five or six really first class graduate students. And I had doubled or tripled the number that I had too. This happened at Berkeley and this happened at Princeton and this happened at Wisconsin. So what had happened is that they, all the, uh, the students, graduate students in mathematics looked at this and a great number of them jumped into it as more interesting than the traditional mathematical fields. And there was this enormous surge of people uh, specializing in set theory. Now, not all of them ended up specializing in set theory, but almost all of them ended up certainly specializing in logic. They, but it, uh, what happened was that that uh, surge due to Paul caused uh, people to enter logic and get degrees in um, uh, model theory uh, and recursion theory. That, that was a very strong uh, uh, initial uh, 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 push. Uh, as I remember, it got his PhD also from church because ch church was, you know, Princeton was the fountain of that sort of thing for all these years. I got the job, job at MIT and had uh, Friedberg as an undergraduate student uh, before Friedberg's uh, uh, graduation. Within a few months of uh, Friedberg learned about the uh, post problem. Uh, as, as to whether there were uh, incomparable recursively enumerable degrees uh, from Hartley, uh, who uh, explained to him uh, the work that Myhill and other people had done in constructing uh, these things. That's because Hartley was studying all those things. So this undergraduate started to work on it and worked on it throughout his remaining undergraduate career and for a few months afterwards and turned up with the priority method and that, and Hartley took that up and wrote it up in his book. What 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 was happening during that period was that uh, my 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 co-workers, which was John Myhill and uh, 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 Jim Decker, they were writing a book uh, on exactly the same subject, uh, which is which was uh, recursion theory coming out of post, but uh, be, because of this, uh, it never came out. What Hartley did was to ask them to, if, if he could incorporate part of their material into his book. And uh, they gave up writing the, the book and his book uh, became very comprehensive. Uh, but uh, he, 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 Hartley's main claim to fame is that he was a, a extremely astute uh, analyzer of arguments. I still like his book <coughs> you know, better than the now standard textbook by my student, Robert Soar of the University of Chicago. I still like uh, Hartley's book because every motivation for every theorem is uh, in the book. Um, I don't know what's going on here, just a minute. Oh yes, now we can see you, yeah, that's good. Uh, suddenly that's this little thing, uh, suddenly this little marker turned up in the middle of the screen <laughs> saying, start, start your video. <laughs> It oh, yeah. That I've, was my prompt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. sorry. So in any case, uh, <coughs> uh, I met Hartley very early. I can't even tell you when, uh, shortly after he got his degree. And uh, he, he was a great assembler. In, in other words, he uh, figured out all the, the pre, uh, uh, the pre uh, Friedberg arguments and uh, wrote them up. It very completely and then wrote up Friedberg's. And then what happened in the early 60s was that uh, Gerald Sachs teased him. Every time that Hartley thought he had his book finished, uh, uh, since the, the, the recursion theory was moving at a rapid pace, Gerald would mention to it something that had just been proved, which Hartley would then try to incorporate in the book. But the, the, the teasing did come to an end and the book actually was published and was very useful then, and it's now very old, but uh, as far as writing out the motivation for arguments, uh, it still stands uh, unequaled as far as I know, uh, whereas the standard book from which a mathematics graduate student learns recursion theory, which is by Robert Soar, uh, does get you to be an expert technically, 
but you sort of leave, lose the entire flavor of the background of the uh, subject if that's your main uh, introduction. Here, many of the famous recursion theorists, or at least the ones who have very prominent positions, have been educated by Richard Shore out of that book. It's a very successful book for producing technicians, but not so successful in the, explaining uh, the motivations for the subject. So that, that's a, a, I, that, this is just an answer to this question that was uh, raised. <laughs> uh, you can't hear me. I haven't, dis your, your, uh, your voice disappeared for a moment. Maybe, maybe it, am I online? You're fine, Emil, just everybody else is You're muted. Fine. You're not supposed to, to hear us. We're supposed to hear you. Just go ahead. Everything okay. is so in any case, that, that was the answer to that aside. So what happened was that what I was saying uh, when you couldn't hear me was that uh, after Paul's results were announced, uh, a great number of young graduate students in a variety of universities throughout the world suddenly changed into logic. Uh, they, did not, uh, they did not necessarily change into set theory because it depends on who was on the faculty of the place they went to. And uh, the result was we had this crop of people in recursion theory uh, and, uh, and uh, model theory and set theory. Uh, and after a while, the subject sort of melded. Why did they meld? It's because when you actually look at it from a very classical point of view, the uh, bare category theorem, which is the 1890s, that basic argument of saying, I will meet these requirements while avoiding meeting those requirements. That is uh, actually fundamental to set theory, fundamental to model theory, and fundamental to uh, uh, recursion theory. In other words, there's an underlying theme of doing things while avoiding other things, which uh, runs through all these subjects and their proofs. Uh, and uh, the result of that basically is that uh, people uh, who wish to can cross contribute between the subjects. At the time that I started out, uh, there was uh, sort of no known connection between the subjects at all. The fact that there's a kind of a common thread running through uh, the, the proofs was uh, not something that was known. At that time, we understood that there was uh, 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 there were arguments that were based on uh, uh, category, and there were arguments that were based on measure. Uh, uh, in classical mathematics. And the measure theoretic arguments turned up the, in the recursion theory probably uh, first with uh, forcing with perfect closed sets of positive measures, which is one of Gerald Sachs's contributions. But uh, it, the fact that it, all, of, all of these things follow a common pattern was not uh, known. A, a, a misleading common, common pattern was uh, complete Boolean algebras. Uh, which is like the uh, Borel sets or the uh, measurable sets, module, module sets of uh, first, the mo module sets of measure zero. That the various, in other words, Boolean valued set theory, uh, the reason it's a little misleading is that it's kind of one of these things where you have an abstract notion which gives you a common version of a bunch of theorems, but when you, it, it, it loses the uh, constructive character of the proofs and the fact that they're all do this and avoid that uh, arguments. They, so the, uh, the set theory, uh, which looked very neat with Boolean valued models immediately after Cohen and after Solovey and so on, uh, it's, it's not, not the technology which actually lasted. It's just a, a, a extremely neat way of uh, uh, phrasing uh, things that are done by direct computation. I want to say that uh, I, I, many of you know this, I'm a complete advocate of teaching mathematics uh, based on the basic computations that are involved uh, at, and then doing the abstractions afterwards. In other words, teaching the algorithms for algebra and analysis and so on, and then teaching the uh, abstractions which give rise to the modern mathematical general formulations. Uh, that, that's a very strong prejudice which I carry out in my uh, uh, own courses completely. I wanted to say something else, uh, which is, is a leftover from the early 1950s and a, uh, uh, something that I learned from the opponent of logic, which was Andre Ve, the, a, the master algebraic geometer who dominated uh, Chicago 
and uh, was anti-logic. Uh, uh, I wanted to impress him as a student, so I took his uh, uh, seminar offered in uh, elliptic and modular functions in, in, in Chicago. And my, the audience was very distinguished in the sense that it was only four people. Uh, one was uh, uh, Armand Borel, one was uh, the, the, uh, my friend, the algebraist Serge Lang, and one was Edward Nelson. Uh, uh, Serge Lang, of course, was uh, spent his career at Yale. Nelson spent his career at Princeton. They were analysts, so they had every reason to be there. I was there just because I liked to learn mathematics and I wanted to impress them. The, the, uh, they, the, the, the people interested in logic were not stupid. So, uh, I, I, what, but when he gave that course, he did not give it out of any modern textbook nor out of any notes. He had these large red books, uh, which he opened old, which he opened up and uh, looked at for a while and then uh, gave his lecture. When he returned those books to the Eckert Library at the University of Chicago, I took them out. They turned out to be the collected works of Kronecker. And, and what he was doing on, at the board shows what an incredible mind he had. He translated all the arguments in Kronecker from the, uh, uh, the Kronecker notation for elliptic and modular functions to uh, uh, the Eisenstein formulation of elliptic and modular functions which are very complicated transformations, which he apparently could do in his head, which I thought was uh, very uh, impressive. That came out, the translate that, that, that course turned out to be his, one of his last books on, uh, uh, which was a, uh, uh, what, what he called arithmetic. So, but in any case, what I learned from him was that you can learn a lot by reading the original texts. And since that time, since 1952 or three, I simply have read almost everything the, as, uh, the principal papers written from uh, the beginning of time to about 1900. So uh, I, and what I was very impressed by was the, uh, the uh, fact that uh, a lot of the old ideas are actually dominant <laughs> today. Uh, I, now, I wanted to make, uh, aside from these historical remarks, I wanted to have uh, five minutes, I probably have 10, uh, I wanted to have a few minutes uh, to discuss some uh, prejudices about the, or at least proposals about the uh, uh, current state of things. Th these are, this is now reference to a subject which I haven't brought up, which is the applications of, uh, or the extensions of logic that have to do with computer science. I don't, the only one that I want to cover is the uh, one that, that asks the question, uh, how simple are the algorithm can you do for a given task? Uh, the, all the present uh, 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 formalizations uh, uh, really depend on the way in which the mathematics is expressed. Uh, if, you, if you take the mathematics and re-express it in, in a different way, uh, uh, you may get uh, what would they, uh, computer scientists now would regard as a completely different problem and a completely different set of bounds. Uh, my, my favorite example, which I've given many times, is uh, very classical and very non, uh, what do you call it, uh, finitistic. It's uh, Fourier uh, analysis. When you take, uh, for example, linear differential equations and you uh, think of them as given analytically so that you uh, solve them by the method of successive approximations or one of its generalizations, uh, but, but by a constructive method. Uh, the, you, and you actually estimate the number of steps involved to approximate uh, to an answer in terms of uh, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, the linear transformation locally that the uh, differential equation represents, you can compute out bounds for that computation procedure. But uh, if you, uh, and it's, it's not so short, uh, long numerical computations involved. But if you say to yourself, I'm going to do a Fourier transformation, then all the simple things uh, turn into uh, uh, problems in algebra. In other words, they tra transforms, uh, transforms uh, analytic problems into problems of the algebra of uh, the differential uh, operators. Those, and, that, and, that, and that's uh, uh, linear algebra. And uh, the, the formal techniques of linear algebra 
give you often a closed form solutions to such things that they for with different constant this this is a, a very old thing which is used been used in engineering since since Boole published his book on differential equation on, on formal methods and differential equations in, in the 1840s or 50s. Uh, and what you discover is this uh, a translation of data types where you take data types of one sort, be, being a good mathematician, manage to figure out a transformation into a different data type. And what you discover is the following generic picture that on one side, uh, a, a computation that you wish to actually proceed, pr proceed with takes a very large number of steps in terms of those primitive notions. And on the other side, in terms, for example, here of the algebraic notions, it's uh, the computation uh, turns something that was an analytic problem into an algebraic problem, and it has a very short-term, easy solution. I can give dozens of examples, actually, out of uh, real mathematics, uh, non-logical mathematics, physical mathematics, in which uh, changing the fundamental uh, primitives in terms of which the logic is, of the subject is expressed changes entirely the aspect of uh, 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 how fast it costs, uh, how expensive it is to compute solutions. Uh, this business of, of, of transformation of structures into structures which are more amenable, that, uh, so to speak, is something that uh, is not preserved uh, uh, by the uh, measures of complexity, how, whether they're very abstract or very concrete or very specific today. Uh, and I think there's uh, uh, going to be a substantial future in, in this area. Uh, there are only small smidgens of, of, of transformations where the underlying structure you're analyzing and therefore the steps of the computer language that's appropriate are actually uh, carried through. Um, I, I, I've been a strong sponsor of uh, uh, parameterized complexity, which is uh, 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 Mike Fellows uh, and Rod Downey's uh, uh, method of uh, taking problems and transforming them from one uh, set of data structures to another. But it's just that's a it's a I think it's, that's an important area, but that's only a, a glimpse of the future since. The, these highly mathematical transformations have an enormous effect. I'm going to give my favorite example, which is uh, the oldest example in the universe, which is uh, Euclid's 150 uh, AD versus uh, geometry somewhat earlier back going back to Thagoras. Uh, you, in Euclidean geometry, as it was taught, and I prefer that way it was taught in schools until the 1950s oh, throughout the world, in Euclidean geometry, as it was taught, you learn to do a certain number of constructions, and you can answer some questions about whether or not a construction is possible. For example, the, 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 the regular solids in a, uh, that you can describe in a sphere. But there are many questions that you couldn't answer at all, such as the, the uh, construction of uh, various regular polygons. The structural transformation that goes from point, line, and incidence to uh, Quadratic algebra, which means simultaneous linear and, diff and quadratic differential equations and many unknowns. That, that simple transformation, which transforms analysis into algebra, meant that uh, Gauss in 1800 was able to solve many of the ancient problems. I think it's a paradigm that uh, this kind of mathematical transformation transforms inaccessible problems into accessible ones. And, uh, and it correlatively transformed, cor cor uh, correlated with this is a transformation of proofs, which uh, means that uh, computation bounds for proofs in uh, geometric language and computation grounds for their translations into algebraic language are different. And the, way, the, the way the good cases operate is you make the translation like from the uh, uh, continuous linear differential equations to algebra, which means uh, so-called transfer functions. Uh, that's a very quick translation. Once you've done that, it's super fast algebra to solve the, the uh, differential equations end of your uh, physical problem. Then you translate back because that's also super fast and you use it on the continuous side where it would have been extremely long to do it in, in, in the continuous. So the transformations of that sort, which transform mathematically transform one subject into another 
completely change the data structures and completely change the form of the things. These are not taken care of in contemporary computer science. And that's my kind of a real complaint about uh, the, the, the whole business of current computational complexity. I'm now going to draw this to a close because I think that's one of the uh, outstanding problems of modern computer science. And then I'm going to ask for questions. And I think I've stopped at the point at which I'm supposed to ask for questions. Okay, thank you very much. That was quite interesting. So uh, the chat through the chat. Oh, let's look at chat. Okay, I, gonna... It doesn't have anything uh, in terms of questions so far. Ah, the, no, no. The third, I, I, it does. The, actually, the second question here uh, uh, does. Mm -hmm. Ah, the, wait a minute. For the first one. Uh, no, I, that's, I don't think that's for me. The second one says, how do you mean this with respect to complexity? Usually complexity bounds uh, with respect to any Turing compu computation model. The answer is that those bounds uh, are bounds on problems that will never actually be used for any purpose whatsoever. They're too general. You want, what you, you have in any given situation, you have a set of practical problems and you try to make up a small set of uh, and, and the, uh, you don't use arbitrary Turing uh, uh, computations. No, I'm not saying it well. What I'm, what I'm saying is that leading, using Turing computation models discourages you from limiting your problem and using computation models based on the, the actual uh, uh, constructs that you're using. It's, uh, it's, the best way to put it is it's, it's so comprehensive a uh, uh, model of transformations is useless in practice. That, that was the answer to Ernest W. Myers. Question. Yeah, Anil, Anil, can sure. I just respond? Oh, oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I don't want to uh, sort of comment on your response. Well, you contradict it completely. I've, it's fine. No, no. Uh, but what I really mean is uh, this kind of complexity theory, which I'm referring to, which is, I think, the common sort of concrete type of complexity theory, uh, is relying on a computational model. And hence says, well, uh, we are using Turing machines, let's say, or random access machines in general. Uh, now, your remarks were kind of it depends very much on how we express a logic or something. Not, not the logic so much as the model itself, the primitives in which terms of which the model. Yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. My comment says if we have a model or whatever, it has to be, I mean, in the sense that I'm referring to it, it has to be uh, encoded somehow into something computable or constructive or something. Oh, no. And Can then, I... and then uh, random access machines or your PC or whatever applies to it. Everything you say is true. However, in the practical ordinary world, what you want to limit yourself to is those uh, to transformations which simplify the problem. And the question as to what kind of structures replace a given structure like an algebraic equations replacing differential equations those transformations have not been studied the ones which send simple uh, I, I i bet to differ i mean they are uh, quite the, fact the general things work don't have, doesn't have anything to do with practical world uh, uh no no there are quite a number of things which uh, results i would say where we say i mean for me uh, a lot of the sort of large publications uh, claim something is simple. And so, so it's just the opposite of, uh, way of what you are just trying to uh, indicate. That's, no. that, that's correct. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I think it's just abstruse if you say, I mean, I'm not referring to the practical things. I mean, the practical things are these complexity bounds of some of them, not everything, of course, uh, are exhibiting uh, uh, rather inherent complexities, which make things like uh, you mentioned, uh, partial differential equations. Or so there are lots of algorithms and 
theories about this, but they say these things in general are very hard. Now, one more sentence. It may be that there are, and it actually is the case usually, that there are some simple examples and uh, usually the authors of these papers only show the most simple examples. I mean, we have been uh, sort of uh, inundated by this thing of wrong example, the wrong impressions in the recent times a lot in our general life. So what I mean is to claim that something is simple, uh, we have to also to say in which range. I have no objections to anything that you said, but what I'm saying is that, that changing the data structures to different data structures makes a lot of problems uh, uh, practically solvable in, you know, by a contemporary machine which would not have been solvable in their original uh, uh, formulation. By, uh, the, the, comp the complexity bounds that you get are entirely different when you look at it from a differential equations point of view or from an algebra point of view. The way I put it is you take a problem and you translate it like with Fourier uh, to an algebra problem. The algebra problem is very quick and then you translate back uh, in order to actually apply it. The translations are cheap the computation on one side is expensive. The computation on the other side is cheap. It's that generic thing. I don't, I'm not criticizing what people have done because they're welcome to do whatever they want. But as far as uh, actually- May I, uh, uh, may I interrupt? Uh, Sorry, I'm back for that like to, once again. If, at this point, excuse me. Uh, um, there should be some order in this uh, discussion. And I think other people also want to ask maybe yeah, questions. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. But we, will, we can return to, to it later, so that's no problem. Uh, but my feeling is that you are talking a little bit past each other. And, uh, no, no, I understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can ask for another, give me another question. Yeah, well, uh, just to, as, a, as a kind of a interruption, let me uh, ask a simple historical question about something that you said. Namely, um, so that conference of 1957, uh, that you mentioned sort of created this uh, community community of logicians in, in, in the US and maybe uh, internationally as well. So uh, firstly, uh, do you remember how many people were at this conference? Uh, uh, I would say roughly speaking 60. 60? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but I mean, not, the not, standards not the just the just the quite I'm saying that from a memory of everybody going swimming in the local lake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, uh, what about the role of the association of symbolic logic? Uh, uh, was it let us say, involved in this or was it not? It, it, somehow it, it, the clientele that read it and the people who uh, published for in the association was extremely limited until then. And uh, it was, in other words, it was a very, it was, I wouldn't say it was moribund, but it wasn't very active. In, uh, mm -hmm. It was the uh, activity and also the f f foundation of new logic journals, you know, followed from that meeting, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm answering your question, but I'm doing my best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what. I mean, uh, it, was, it, was, it was. We regarded it as dead compared to, to, to the American Mathematical Monthly, which was for college teachers, and the uh, uh, Annals of Math, which was for mathematicians, which were the two main American journals. Uh, the, they were very active and had extremely good math papers in them. The uh, Journal of Symbolic Logic did not have very good uh, logic papers in it. And, they, and it was only a small number of people who contributed to it. That changed almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Because the people started working together who had previously never met each other. Mm -hmm. OK. And yet another point from uh, uh, that I noticed in your talk was uh, the fact that Cohen uh, wanted Gödel's approval of his, of his proof, right? So he. Um, sent him uh, 
his uh, manuscript or no, he, he presented it to him in person when he taught in Princeton. person. So he really explained to Gödel the proof rather than sending him the. No, text. He, he did not explain the proof. I delivered him to Gödel's house. Mm -hmm. He presented the thing to Gödel and uh, took him back. I mean, the uh, uh, he simply presented the paper to Gödel, and Gödel read it in a week. That said, mm -hmm. yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And Gödel so uh, asked, Gödel asked only one question, which is. Uh, Paul had said that such and such was an equivalence relation, and it wasn't. And so Gödel said, why did you call this an equivalence relation? He was very uh, upset. Words, the only question he had was due to basically uh, an accidental misprint in the, uh, in the paper. So no, no, he didn't talk to Gödel about it at all, mm -hmm. at any point. Yeah, well, what he gave him personally is a text. Gödel read the text. And sort of in a week later, he understood what was there and, and approved it. So. And, and, and in, the sem in the seminar that he did attend, which was later, uh, he said, ah, oh, if I'd known it was so simple. <laughs> okay. He missed the idea. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. OK. Um, so uh, there were some, uh, some questions. So give me one of them. In, the, in, the, in, the... in this chat. In the chat, you can see uh, by Andre Rodin. Maybe Andre can uh, yeah, yeah. ask it. In, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much uh, oh, for a great lecture. I was particularly interested in this last point uh, as a more like historian of mathematics of like change, yeah. change yeah. primitive. Uh, yeah, but but this particular example about Euclid's geometry, uh, Frank, I did not quite understood because it, you know, in my understanding, this. Uh, kind of algebraic approach, right, which has long history and kind of was definitely made by René Descartes, but it's actually, in fact, was a kind of meta theory. So, so people later, like Gauss, you mentioned, right, that they proved, say, that certain problem cannot be solved uh, by Galois theory, etc. On the other hand, it's less clear to me, at least, that it's really allowed to solve more effectively, computationally speaking, some of uh, oh, Euclidean no, no, no. Con con constructive problems. No, 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 let me answer that. Uh, mm -hmm. In the original uh, uh, exposition of, the, uh, of Descartes, literally, if you look at page two of his book, yeah. uh, he gives the translation of, uh, of uh, his own geometry into purely algebraic uh, uh, form. What happened then was that uh, uh, a lot of people used it to 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 uh, to uh, turn you uh, problems that had previously been done by Euclidean geometry, including all the problems of astronomy, were translated into quadratic systems or quadratic equations, uh, where you had some idea how to computationally solve them. But what came out as a theorem in the 18 something or others, I can't remember who to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. was the uh, uh, mechanism which uh, translates uh, uh, what you might call uh, first order theory of constructions entirely into quadratic algebra and proves they're the same. In fact, when I give my history course, I call it uh, the uh, 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 Descartes theorem. Uh, so from a computational point of view, asking whether something can be constructed is then rewritten as, as uh, asking whether a, a, a algebraic theorem can be uh, established. And it's, it is quite the, it, it is the theory of quadratic uh, simultaneous equations and many variables, which is the substitute for Euclidean geometry. In other words, one translate, the uh, geometry of construction problem really does always translate into an algebraic problem and the algebraic problems uh, that you can then talk about whether or not they're solvable or not. Uh, the, the business of, of, of uh, uh, automation, uh, how to put it, the automation that uh, several people have done of uh, original Euclidean geometry of constructions, I like very much. But the fact is that ordinary uh, algebra calculators, when you make the translation, can, can uh, get the same results. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a, a, a reasonable answer. The only thing is that the data, what I was emphasizing is that the data structures in, in uh, point line and plane geometry and forming square roots of positive things and so on, 
the data structures in Euclidean geometry uh, and the data structures in the algebra are not the same basic data structures. So the change of data structures allows the problems to turn into a different form where you can solve them. I'm, what I'm emphasizing is that the theory of, of changes of the basic data structure yeah. have not been thoroughly investigated, even though they've been around for a long time. Yes, thank you. No, I, I can't, 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 clarify the point. I, I myself did not understand these things mm -hmm. as well as I now do uh, before teaching mm -hmm. the history course many times. <laughs> no, no, my point is that I absolutely agree, but I think this uh, old development had kind of a meta-theoretical bent. And by the way, the same thing, 20th century with Tarski, with his paper on what is elementary geometry, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's very important theoretically, but it hardly gives really computational power, right? Actually, I think it has a lot of unused no. computational power, yeah. this particular thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, really, a lot of unused computational power. No, okay. In other words, I'm just saying that this, this sort of translation is not... Uh, purists take one set of data structures and work entirely with proofs that involve those data structures. Instead of taking a look at alternate data structures, which may give proofs that are very different and much shorter. I, maybe that's the, the main point that I was trying to make. And mathematicians do that all the time. I mean, in, in theoretical mathematics, uh, changing the form of the data structures entirely often solves the problem. I'm thinking, for example, of the uh, Poincaré con conjecture, which all the people I know of my generation and the later generations worked on using what you call topological methods, which go back to oh, Poincaré. Okay. And uh, they did not solve the problem. It was solved by another of my colleagues who moved to Columbia, uh, really, he, the one who figured out that if you translated that all into uh, the uh, correct differential equations, then the differential equation would take a, a distorted sphere and slowly turn it into the regular sphere. That's a total change in data structures. Absolutely. <laughs> Richard Hamilton, you mean, right? I, I have a lot of mathematical examples like that, where really changing the mm. data structure made it possible to actually do the problem. Uh, and I'd like that to go into computer science, which it has not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have another one? Uh, there were some comments. Again, oh, returning to this uh, maybe issue. I could, maybe complex. I can see them. Uh -huh. Okay. For example, there is this comment by Serov. Uh, so. 5.20 p.m. if you go to uh, the chat, I, you will see it. Our own complexities are moving I'm, 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 to some simple <laughs> constructive universal thing. I am not sure I understand this question fully, but maybe you oh, will. No, first of all, I'm talking about uh, uh, basically the idea that uh, under really good transformations of data types, uh, complicated things became made much simpler to do. And the basic paradigm I have is the paradigm of you take it in one language, you translate it into the other language, which has different primitives and therefore different uh, computation procedures that you use. In the second language, the uh, programs that are, uh, run very much faster. And then you translate back. The translations back and forth are lo very low cost. And you get uh, your answers much faster. Uh, I could give you a great number of examples where that actually happens. And I, uh, I'm not so interested in what the exact definition of complexity is. But I'd like it to be a topic in computer science. <laughs> okay. Um, um, maybe I will ask something else. Uh, so it could something be completely else. different. There was one topic which was suspiciously absent in your lecture. Oh, good. Uh, however, I sort of expected it to be there, namely AI. Oh, the, 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 I'm very enthusiastic about the successes of AI. The, when, when it started out with my friends at MIT and uh, uh, Stanford, uh, the computation power didn't exist to make anything practical. And therefore, the, the, you've got toy systems of all sorts. Uh, the main advantage that we have now is cheap memory. It's, it, first of all, certainly it's true that it's nice that all of the, the uh, chips operate very rapidly, 
But the fact is that the limitations that my friends had in the 50s and 60s, McCarthy and so on, uh, these limitations were due to the, to the fact that you ran out of memory very rapidly for most of your computations. Now memory is super cheap, and it's basically the reason that you can do these very large problems. Now, what, what that means is that these heuristic techniques, which you couldn't really use uh, either in statistics or in AI, uh, have now become uh, practical. My favorite example is this business, which actually occurs in the big, uh, in the analysis, in the software for big data sets, is the business of being able to resample small samples, resample over and over again from a very big population, which was never practical before. And that, that resampling business goes back to, to uh, uh, a well known statistician at uh, Stanford, a logician statistician. But it's a resampling over and over again to find uh, that you've missed some information because some sample makes some uh, if then relation uh, correct, which was not correct originally. And then you investigate that. This business of the very rapid resampling and uh, the uh, use of the uh, data types uh, for uh, uh, what do you call it? Or, uh, linear difference equations and many variables with uh, variable coefficients, the, the, which, which are uh, highly tractable. Uh, that plus statistical optimization tests allows you to go through very large samples to look through relationships which would not have been practical to look for previously. They, they're not based on uh, mathematical statistics. They're more, they're, you could call them Bayesian, but what they're based on is that you're looking for regularities and when you find them, you record them. This has been, uh, uh, has had these miraculous applications, but honestly, it's they're miraculous only because they couldn't possibly have been performed before. You simply had to have an immense amount of memory to do them. So areas that, that almost closed in the early 1960s because of the lack of, of uh, large amounts of memory, therefore large amounts of uh, uh, being able to uh, resample, uh, that's gone. And now we see these gigantic machines which can make associations, which are not based on any statistical model. They're just based on finding the association by repeat, repetitive sampling and optimization. I find this quite marvelous. I have no idea exactly how it connects with modern logic, but I like it. But I, at least I, could, I figured out what it is. <laughs> that was the first thing. <laughs> yeah, so you foresaw my second question, how does it connect to modern logic? No, so uh, the answer is that Modern logic consists, consists of, of, of studying systems where you have primitives already established, in other words, basic relations and uh, basic sets and so on. And you, you study one way or another what can be deduced from those relations. Question is, where do you get the relations for the relational system? And the answer is, at present, the large data and the analysis of small data sets that you, you find the regularities there and you name them by predicate letters. That's the connection with logic. Yeah. You can then study the systems that you get from new primitives that you never saw before because they emerge from the data. Yeah, I, I find that from from marvelous, from actually. Statistics, from statistics, that's what basically you suggest, yes. Mm -hmm. You do see that I keep up with things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, OK. Um, are there more, more? Okay, there is one more question in, in the chat. Good. Uh, what are your thoughts on univalent foundations as a syntactic rather than semantic way of going between problem domains? I, I really like it. Uh, this is again the business of changing the basic data structures. These da these data structures are initials uh, and. and uh, the founder who dropped dead, I had invited up to Cornell a year ago. He works also, and the, the implementations of a lot of that work were to be done by uh, uh, Bob Constable, who started doing it here. And of course, I've been doing constructive mathematics forever. Wolski. But, but the thing is that it's a different set of primitives and a different set of computations will be rapid with those primitives. And I like that. Those primitives come out of uh, a, a, a general, uh, you know, a, 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 homotopy theory and they, they're very they're very interesting and very different from the primitives that we're used to 
but they, they are just primitive initials in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in categories and it's they're easy to think about and the logic that arises by using those primitives would be very interesting to study. It's more lambda calculus than it is uh, 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 traditional first order or second order logic. I like it in any case. Okay. Um. Oh, I, I just saw one pop up and go. I don't regard uh, uh, the world as consisting of sequences at all. I think of it as consisting of uh, labeled graphs, <laughs> including words and including proofs. That's why I prefer to blow to uh, any of the older traditional linear things. Now, what's the, I, that one I can't figure out. I, it came from it. Okay, I think it goes. Uh far away. So let, let's, um, yeah, so uh, if there are no more questions from the audience, uh, I think we are more or less ready to close this discussion. Very and good. Before, we, before we actually uh, finish this lecture, I would like to thank you very much for giving us uh, this opportunity to, uh, to hear you and uh, to see your reminiscences and thoughts on uh, broad topics in logic, because this, uh, I, I feel that somehow in ordinary mathematical conferences, people seldom discuss general principles somehow. This is actually what we wanted to, uh, to do more with this. But, uh, but I do have the advantage of age. Yeah. I'm older than everybody else, therefore I take more liberties. Yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, I know that it was... Uh, Difficult two talks with a short break between. No, them. no, I can talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, let us thank the, the today's speaker, Anil Niro. Thank you very much. Thank you.